This is where I came in. This is perfect. Testing. 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 One, two, three. Here I am. <laughs> Including. Oh, you mad. Oh, oh. You mad. <sighs> you mad, impulsive fool. Dark. <laughs> so ghostly. So beautiful. Haunting. The movie will fan. Over and over and over. Over and over again. It's like nothing in the world. Claw hugging. Aspects of zandiacal decadent slander. I do anything to get it back. Would you come with us, sir? Perform a world. Don't let dogs yawn. Perform a world. Crayolas. They're great. Totally. Oh. Totally. Oh my goodness. Totally thrilled. Let's just do it. You have me. Hi everyone, welcome to episode number eight of Andy's Treasure Trove. Glad you're here. Hey, have you noticed that every time that I come out with a new episode, the opening little collage is... A little more complex, I put a little uh, bit or two or three from the previous episode into each one, so it gets more and more dense as it goes on. Despite that, I'm getting kind of tired of it myself. (laughs) I don't know about you. Um, I think maybe we'll have a contest. The first contest of Andy's Treasure Trove, San Francisco, will be those of you who are um, musicians or uh, recording artists or just goofballs, uh, maybe you want to uh, make up a theme song for Andy's Treasure Trove and send it to me and I'll play it over the air. All right, um, that's the first contest, and we're not going to have a deadline, um, but, you know, everyone's a winner. The highlight of this episode is a man named John Kalaki, who I've known for a number of years. He leads, well, I'll let him tell you about his various parallel lives, as he calls them. Well, I do have parallel lives, which are really, really fun, and I hope we're going to be talking about this documentary concert film I did called Janicean, live from Grand Center. I'm, I'm really anxious to talk about it because, like I'm sure most of my listeners, we remember at 17, which was in the 60s, right? Well, uh, some of your older 17? listeners would, would remember from 1967 a song called Society's Child. Oh, of course. Of course. And she had, she had wrote that when she was 14 years old, and uh, it had been released. Shadow Morton was her producer who did the Shangri-Las and stuff. So it was oh. kind of a little odd that a folk, a little folk singer would be produced by Shadow Morton, but he actually loved the song, and uh, but it went nowhere. And then uh, Lenny Bernstein, when he was doing his CBS news specials about, first it was kids' concerts for classical music, well, he did one called Inside Pop, the Rock Revolution, in 67 that had, he was looking at the new lyricists like Bob Dylan, like Robert McQuinn from The Birds, like Mick Jagger, Rolling Stones. And he introduced to national television 15-year-old Janice Ian singing Society's Child. And it was um, a song about interracial dating. And I was living in the south side of Chicago, which is very segregated, Irish Catholic uh, parish, you know. And uh, the song meant a lot to me. Well, when I first heard it, I thought she had bad vision. I thought, oh, she can't see him anymore. (laughs) <laughs> and then I got a little older, and I realized what they were talking it. about. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, she for about three years, she was on Verve Forecast, and then they dropped her. They said, you're not a young wonderkind anymore. So she went to Philadelphia, and as she talks about in her autobiography that she just released, she had a nervous breakdown and just kind of spent about three years recovering. Mm-hmm. And uh, wrote Jesse. Well, which one was Jesse? Jesse was a big hit for Roberta Flack. Jesse, I'm lonely. Come home. It was. It was anyway. This very slow ballad, and what it what it then did is realized to the record industry that she actually could write, and so she re- released an album called Stars that had Jesse on it and some other things. Um, Stars became a song that Barbara Cook covered. Cher covered. Uh, became actually the title song of a Cher album, mm. and so people started covering her songs, and um, so that was. Very nice for her. She was now 20, all of 20. Um, and then she recorded an album called Between the Lines. I remember that. That had, had 17 on it, and it was kind of a fluky crossover hit into pop radio, and it was all about the ugly duckling in high school waiting for the calls that never came. And So all of us alienated ones kind of resonated with it. And what was interesting at that moment, she became very big for a moment in the pop world. And Billy Joel was the opening act for her. 
mm. on tour. So she went literally from playing 500 seat halls to 2,000 seat halls to 10,000 seat halls within six months. Mm. So life changed. And she had a great run for maybe three years that way, as, as pop people do. Giorgio Mordar was asked to do the uh, soundtrack for a movie called Foxes that Jody. Foster was in, hmm. and so he called up Janice again, and so she came out and she recorded a um, a disco song. She wrote it, and recorded it in one take because that's all he wanted to do. And she said, "Well, I just was warming up." He said, "Okay, you can do another take if you want, but I'm busy." You know, <laughs> so he, he was just turning out his Donna Summer's hits and thing. A fly too high. It was huge everywhere except the United States. Hmm. Um, so she, it was big in Japan and Australia. I didn't know her at that point. Um, about 10 years ago, she was singing uh, at Stern Grove, and I brought my 1968 book of her poems that had been released with me, which I still had, and I just went up and introduced myself and uh, asked her to sign the book for me, and, and her daddy was there, Victor Fink was her dad's name, who lived in Oakland, and he taught music uh, for, for years with kids at the uh, French American School here in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and he did storytelling for the a kids' hospital in Oakland, and so her dad and I sort of got to be buds, and Janice and I started emailing back and forth, and uh, through the years when she would come through the Bay Area, we would always get together and have dinner uh, and catch up with each other's lives, and four years ago, I said, you know, I think first, I've admired her work since 1967, so 40 years, uh, and what I didn't tell you is after the big comeback at, at 17, she toured the world in a very big way, and uh, she sort of lost track of her finances. Mm. And uh, one day she got a, a notice from her bank that uh, her checks had bounced, and she kind of wondered what happened, and she called her bookkeeper, and he, he wasn't around. And then she got a letter from the IRS saying that she owed uh, $1.4 million in unpaid taxes, and her bookkeeper who she had had from when she was 14 years old, a friend of her parents, had evidently kept two sets of books and stole everything. So she had $1,000 to her name. The IRS took it. Uh, and so she was penniless. And Wow. And what year was that? Well, it was about 20 years ago, 88, around that. Uh, so she, her record contracts had ended. People didn't think she was viable anymore. I mean, you know, she's... It's kind of unbelievable at, at you know, your mid-30s that you're thrown out again. Uh, but someone said to her, well, you know, if you move to Nashville, you can actually, you know how to write a song, but if you work with partners, you can write commercial songs. And you could probably make a good living as a songwriter. And so she, she moved there, literally penniless, and uh, sold everything she had to start paying off this debt. It took her 14 years to pay off the debt to the IRS. She still had to pay the one point something million. Yeah. Wow! Yeah, every every dollar, uh, and she couldn't pursue her bookkeeper, and then he died. So, kind of sad. Yeah. But she started writing. Other people started covering her songs again. Mm -hmm. Kathy Matea did. Bette Midler had one um, called "Some People's Lives," uh, and so so that was that started working for her. She met a wonderful woman, uh, Pat who she's not been with for 20 years. Mm. And so she rebuilt her life that way. Um, and John Mellencamp was doing a movie. He was making a movie. He wanted the one movie he made. And he wanted to use one of Janice Ian's songs. So he called her up and he said, why aren't you singing anymore? You know, you're not touring anymore. What, what's that? You know? And so she changed her, her model. She started self-producing her albums, going on the road again as a single act. Um, and after every show, she sells her CDs, and she literally makes her money that way. Uh, and through the years, I admired her as an artist about um, the, social val the social justice in her songs, uh, not only racism and homophobia and issues around incest and violence against women. Um, I, I, she did an amazing song called Tattoo uh, about the Holocaust, and so she, she's always been a political songwriter. And with my values. Um, and her life story was, you know, child wonder kid tossed away, huge, penniless. You know, I mean, it's kind of like, um, it's an interesting art. And through it all, she kept writing her songs. She, 
she sees herself as a writer. And that was her salvation. And that has sort of been my journey along with her. I found that even when I didn't know her, that every time a new album came out, there'd be one song that really meant something to me. And I, um, so it resonated. So she said, hey, you know what? No one's interested in me anymore. But if you raise the money, we'll do it. Of course, it would be lovely to do. And uh, she said, but I can't, I can't help you raise the money. I just don't have those connections. And it takes me everything I can do to get $10,000 together to put a CD out. So, you know, so it took me three years. You know, a short time for documentary filmmakers, long time in the world. And I, I learned a lot. I got turned down by about 20 funding agencies nationally. And uh, the fun part, Andy, is that we're sitting here in my office at the San Francisco Foundation. And, you know, I have a very great, blessed job of evaluating proposals for our board to support or not support. Um, and going out then and asking for money. And I didn't ask locally because it would just be too confusing. Uh, and to see how rude, how ridiculous, how um, inappropriate foundation people are to artists, how they treat them. And I would have an experience that I would be getting, you know, on weekends or evenings, I'd be writing these things and sending them off. And I would be getting the bizarrest responses. And then sometimes these same people would call me during the day, not realizing I was the same person and talk like, peer-to-peer -peer in philanthropy and i just that's bizarre completely bizarre but i i never called them on it it's like you know okay whatever um but you have a new tell-all book that's coming uh, out well <laughs> it would be of interest to me and me i think uh, <laughs> but i think every artist knows how inappropriate foundation people get and do you think they get that way only with artists or with anyone who wants money from them no matter what the well, area well i think people forget that actually our job is service and our jobs, my job here depends on serving the arts community. And if I serve the arts community while well, I'm doing a good job. And uh, the more requests I get, the more open I should be. And people get kind of like inundated with paper and, and things like that. Um, but it, it was just a great experience over the three years to really remind myself how to listen and how to be there for artists in the community. And that it wasn't my ideas. And I was hired to do it was I was hired to implement the ideas of artists in the Bay Area. Anyway, so three years well spent. Three years well spent, <laughs> um, humbling, um, and and you were asking for money for a concert film, not a documentary about her life. Well, I, it was going to be a it was going to be a documentary about her life, um, and you know the budget was about a quarter of a million dollars um, because David Geffen was her first agent. Hmm. Uh, she went to school with Laura Nero, and she had great stories about when Laura was in the recording studio. Laura didn't know how to read music. She could just play. And Janice was trained. Her daddy was a musician, so, so, so she could actually read music. And, you know, one day, Geffen calls her up, and he's saying, you got to get to the studio. Laura's thrown a fit. You know, so Laura was screaming and yelling, and Janice walked in and said, what's wrong? And she says, they don't play purple. And all the studio musicians are kind of <laughs> looking around like, yeah, we don't play purple. We don't know what purple means. You know? um, so Janice figured out <laughs> with Laura, hysterical in the corner, figured out what Laura Nero actually wanted her musicians to play. And then she could translate it in musician's terms. So, you know, there, there's some great Joan Baez is a good friend of Janice. Mm. Um, it, it could be a really you know nice film. And to remind people, people haven't thought of Janice and since the 70s. And then as soon as you mentioned at 17, everyone gets all warm and gushy. It's a, it was a nice signature song for her to have. So, you know, the journey began. I um, got some great archival footage. Uh, I, I finally found, um, as you know, in filmmaking, it's very hard to, to locate some of this footage. But I found the Leonard Bernstein 1967 CBS News special, hmm. which was important because CBS said they didn't have it. The Bernstein estate said they didn't have it. And then I said, well, CBS News. And they said, well, the BBC owns CBS News archives. But I didn't know it's, that. It doesn't sound like it. But, but what was, I was lucky about is when I contacted the BBC folks, 
the person knew who Janice Ian was and said, oh, whatever happened to her? And I said, they said, well, I'll, I'll help you locate this. So it, it had, because, you know, when you're looking for license, they either look on the computer if they have it or don't have it. Well, they actually had it. They didn't realize they had it, hmm. which, was, which was just lovely. You know, fifty dollars a second. So well, I was going to say, finding it is one thing. A minute, uh, uh, paying know, for it is another yeah. thing. But I, that's how uh, the piece opens mm -hmm. with Lenny Bernstein uh, introducing her, um, and then there's some sweet footage from the seventies of her singing at seventeen, nineteen seventy-five. Then we were going to. I did a whole hour-long. Well, let me switch a second. I'd been consulting in St. Louis um, with Grand Center, which is. Uh, an arts district, so I've been helping them, and I realized the Sheldon Theater was hardwired to their new PBS building. So I said, "Well, gee, we got to do live music here, you know, and put it on uh, PBS." So I helped them put together two programs, and then I said, "Well, if I bring the Janicean uh, project here, would St. Louis be interested?" And they said, "Yes, of course." And so the Missouri Film Commission, God bless them, had put aside ten million dollars in tax credits. For, for filmmakers to come into Missouri um, and they would pay one third of the cost for projects. So I was able to get $51,000 from the Missouri Film Commission. Terrific. Uh, Anheuser-Busch threw in some money as well. Um, and then I raised uh, about $20,000 from individuals. Now, why would Anheuser-Busch have a particular interest in funding a film about Janice Ian? I'm just curious. They were more, well, they are based in St. Louis, mm -hmm. so they like the idea of Grand Center and the Sheldon Theater and a KETC Channel 9 collaborating together, and they did it, I think, more as a local mm -hmm. um, sponsor, mm -hmm. but they also, uh, that year, had been given uh, the Human Rights Award or something for, for the St. Louis's most friendly GLBT employer, so the, it it wasn't the defining thing that happened, but they also liked then. They didn't know who she was, but they thought, well, a lesbian icon, that's sort of great for Anheuser Bush's brand as well to kind of. So well, all of those things came together. Uh, Janice lives in Nashville, so she drove um, a year ago to the station. We did an hour long interview about her life, which was uh, fantastic. It's lovely to do uh, in there. High definition studios. Was that with an audience or not? No, mm -hmm. uh, it's just uh, the two of us uh, with lights and the camera and sound people. Uh, and I was, when I was done, I was going to take the the master tape and the TV station said, "No, leave it here." You know, it's it's all on climate control and stuff. And I said, "Well, okay," but I just had a, a time coded copy. And I said, "You know, I'll call in my edits when when we're ready to do them." So then I raised the rest of the money. That was a year ago. This year, uh, we did the concert on June 19th. Um, and two weeks before that, I emailed in the edits I wanted to incorporate from the interview. They lost the tape. Did they know immediately they had, or did they say, what do you mean? We don't have the tape. Well, uh, they said, are you sure? Didn't you take that tape? And I said, no, no, you, you really insisted that it stay with you. So I said, you have it somewhere. Uh, and, you know, at that point, it was like, okay, well, the tape's lost. But we had already gotten a commitment from the St. Louis station to air it on June 27th so, with the concert on June 19th. So it's like, uh, there's enough for me to figure out how to do. Because I've never done something of this scale. And there was a four-camera shoot in front of an audience that then on the 19th had to be done by the 24th because we had to send it off and get it all um, closed captioned. Um, so I had to let it go. So it wasn't a documentary anymore. And I, and I hadn't gotten the money to do Geffen and, and the other people uh, to fly around for that. So I thought, well, we're going to make the best concert film we can make. I have the great archival footage of Leonard Bernstein and then soundstage from Chicago in 75. And I have some really beautiful photographs from that she kept throughout her life of her growing up in public. Uh, so I layered all that in. Um, the station was very nervous because I hadn't done something like this. So they said, well, you would be listed as a producer. I said, well, in my world, directors is what I imagine I'm doing. And they said, well, we're, we're, 
with all the unions and stuff, it's very complicated. And so I was kind of not working in television before. I didn't realize that producers actually call the shots, um, but I still want it director. So, so I'm listed as producer and co-director. And um, Kent Samuel from the station is fantastic. He was a co-director and he works at the station. He knew all the ins and outs and he just did everything that I wanted. He wanted to do it. He wanted to do it right. And then in the editing, worked with a great editor and Kent didn't even come in until the last, I had, I had, you know, the 57 minutes and done. And, uh, Came in and he made two tweak suggestions that were totally right. Put them in and we were done. So uh, what was nice is um, I then, it aired June 27th, and I sent it off to um, NITA, National Education Telecommunications Association, that distributes things for uh, PBS stations. And they loved it. And so they um, did a feed date of October 19th to all the PBS stations nationally um, and that night it aired in uh, Vermont um, right as we speak it's airing in Philadelphia this week it's going to be in Seattle, Minneapolis, St. Paul San Francisco KQED on November 15th New Orleans, Cincinnati, Dayton, Nashville Tucson, Austin Her Today Alaska is going to show it December 1st throughout the state um, so I won't know yet as you, as you know, and when, when things are distributed to me, I don't know what, how big the coverage is going to be, but already it's like it was offered <laughs> on Sunday, and this is how many cities that I know uh, picked it up. And so I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled uh, for me, of course. It's just great. But I'm thrilled for Janicean because she's 57 years old, and she's still a very potent writer, a great singer, and she still has great things to say. So it's it's a dream come true. And I assume she's seen the piece? She did see it when it was finished. She understood that the day of the concert, I had from the 19th to the 24th to finish it. So she did whatever I wanted, and she told me I could um, mix, it, mix up the concert any way I wanted to. Um, we had a great time shooting. Um, there's a she, Sesame Street did an album of songs that actually Janicean got a, a Grammy for. And she, that was 73. And the song was called Ginny, the Flying Girl. And I said to Janice, so why don't you revive that? No one's heard that song. You know, and it's 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 a fun, upbeat a children's song. So she practiced. And, and of course, during the concert, she had to do it four times. <laughs> she kept blowing the last verse, and, oh. but we cut all that out. So the wonderful thing about editing, of course, is that it looks. Uh, and we had Janice was just in the Bay Area, and she was on tour, and she had a hole in her tour, and so Rialto Cinemas in San Rafael. I don't know if you know those guys up there, Kai Boyd. They're just fantastic. Um, they did a screening of it, and so Janice and I were in the audience, and it was a. Uh, benefit for the Sonoma Peace and Justice Center, and 200 people were there, and uh, it was great to see it big on the screen, and I think that was the first time Janice Ian saw it. And did she turn to you weeping and say, you've, you've made my life, or uh, did she say, hey, pretty good? She turned and said, thank you. Well, I want to make a comment on what you said about how you reinvented the whole project when they lost your tape. Because this is something that I hear over and over again, and that I've actually experienced many times. You have your grand plan, and then anything from a little piece to a gigantic piece of it doesn't work out for some reason. And you, and you can't just do it without that. You have to do it entirely differently. The, the miracle is that you can. That even though you were saying, this is how it's going to be, this is how it's going to be, this is how it's going to be, and then, oh no... And it can turn out wonderful, I mean, better even than if you had had your original footage. You will never know. I, I, well, I think it, it turned out better in the end. And, you know, the, the, I've made short films, 15 short films, and in each of them I have sort of the storyboard idea before I start of what I want. And then once you're editing, you can't, you, you can't, you have to almost destroy those and say, here's the material 
what emerges from this material. That's right. And that, it's hard to do. Yeah, and that's what we got. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it's also great uh, lessons to just use what you have. Yeah. And that's, oh, yeah, it's a good life lesson. Uh, and I, I, I do think this concert will serve Janice in better by being reintroduced to all these markets as someone than a, than a documentary because it shows her so vital, so potent. And people go, oh, yeah, wow. You know, and, and uh, it's nice her her autobiography called Society's Child was released in July. So there's, um, there's a nice momentum right now of people hoping to remember her. So I hope that's my goal is for people to remember Janice Ian. Well, tell us something about Janice Ian that we might not be able to glean from the film. Well, she's very funny. And most of us think of her in these very slow, sad, heartbroken, you know, um, disenfranchised kid <laughs> way. Uh, and she's just, and she's very, very funny. There's 15 songs in the concert. The one I didn't include was called Married in London. Um, and it's, it's a commentary about she and Pat got married in Toronto. And, but how in some countries they're legal and other, and in her own country, of course, they're not legal. Um, and, but it's a, it's a very funny, pithy social commentary song. Um, in her concert, she's also, she tells jokes that are, you know, I mean, it's, they're very tied into what she's talking about. And there's a lot of laughter. Um, I think if you see the film, you're just going to, I focus on the songs. Mm-hmm. So it really went almost from song to song. So you're not going to see the funny side of Janice. Oh. Well, that can be in the, uh, when you have bonus material for the DVD release. Bonus material. Well, no, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, on to, you know, other, other ideas that I want uh-huh. to do. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. I did promise my husband, Larry, that, um, I wouldn't dive right into a project immediately, but I do have two other projects that are percolating. Do you want to mention them or would that be bad luck? Oh, it wouldn't be bad luck because someone else does it. It'd be great. I'll go on to something else. You know, the two ideas is with, in in St. Louis, with working with Grand Center, um, we really saw how live television and music works really well with with this and these other two programs of local music. Mm -hmm. So I've been talking to um, Adrian Ellis at Jazz at Lincoln Center and said, you know, you got everything there with Winton except television capability. You can... You have great audio quality in your theaters where you can actually tape concerts. And I think a Willie Nelson, Winton Marsalis CD actually was taped in concert. And I said, but he said, yeah, we don't have television capability. I said, well, St. Louis has it. And maybe we can create a jazz series for PBS about live jazz right now and have Winton be the face of jazz, like Lenny Bernstein was the face of classical music. Um, and we can shoot it in St. Louis. Why not? You know, And we can do it a lot cheaper. Um, than you could in New York. And also, they, these crews are there. They know how to do this. They know how to shoot music really well. Uh, I sent them the Janet Scene thing to show them uh, what a four-camera shoot could look like. Uh, and so they're thinking about it. So, you know, other than building that bridge, I, I don't need to be involved in that series at all, but it's like a nice, nice way to do stuff. Uh, second thing is, in the uh, early 80s, I worked for... Trisha Brown Dance Company, mm-hmm. who I think is a wonderful artist, remains a wonderful artist. Well, in the same building where Trisha lives is David Gordon, who is also another wonderful postmodern choreographer. His wife, Elda Setterfield. Uh, Lucinda Childs lived in that building, another postmodern choreographer. Douglas Dunn lived in that build, still lives in that building, another postmodern choreographer. And Joan Jonas, the video artist, lives live there. And what interested me is that except for Lucinda, they all still live there. They they bought this building early on in the 70s as struggling young artists. And like, how did they get real estate together? And then in this building really is, for me, the sweet spot of what the postmodern dance movement happened. It was on the, in those floors. You know, y- Yvonne Rayner was before then they were all danced in Yvonne's company, but but they were the next iteration of that. And then they went out. And now many of them are at the end of their careers. People don't remember them. All of them, maybe Trisha may be the most high profile, but even 
her name's not remembered, but I thought that the, the original organizing construct is the building to, to, to frame the whole thing about look at who has li- who lives in this building and the impact they've had on their art form. I like that. Yeah. Well, you know, if it becomes something great, if someone else takes it, great. I'll I'll do another thing. Um, and that house is in what neighborhood? Uh, it's in uh, what it's now called Soho. And of course, in the seventies, it was an abandoned space where all the light industry was, and now it's big, big and fancy. But they luckily got their space early. Mm-hmm. So, and then there's a whole other obsession that I don't know if you know about. Um, I have been for the past two years uh, learning how to show Shetland ponies in county fairs. Since I was waiting so long, uh, working in the Genesee and my husband Larry said, why don't you just pick up the camera and play with your ponies and see what comes. And so, Ponyman SF on YouTube, you can see my shot and ponies. And uh, what I do is I drive in a cart and so it's just me and the pony and uh, in, in my cart and uh, we do obstacles where we go in and out of things, back up into things, do circles, uh, and also what's called country pleasure driving, which it's not racing. It's sort of like dressage in carts. Hmm. And the ponies are judged on their actions. And then you're told to come in at a trot. And then um, and there's an extended trot. There's a walk. They have to reverse. They have to stand still. When the judge comes to your pony, the pony has to take three steps back and then three steps forward and stand still again. Um, and so I've been doing this. I, I loved ponies as a kid. Uh, and I don't know. I, I As you know, 12 years ago, I, I got paralyzed from surgery. And so I had a hard time walking. And uh, having being able to drive these ponies and move through space in a different way has allowed me to kind of dance and run again in the world. So it's been very freeing. And I also love learning something, being a beginner at something. And though it's very important to, to be at something totally out of your element mm-hmm. and to be learning. Uh, and, it's, and I've learned so many skills just from that. And in the pony world, it, it's a little like Best in Show, that dog film. I mean, that you know, it's it, the obsessive types, and there's differences between mini horses and Shetlands, and then Shetlands, there's the moderns and the classics, and I, I, I you know, everybody <laughs> loves their their part of it. Uh, but I love these animals. I love them. And for the past year, I've been showing a pony named Candy, was my show pony. My friends down at Fog Ranch in uh, Watsonville uh, own Candy, and I did six or seven shows with her, and uh, we did really well. So you know these people who have this pony, and they let they say, yes, you may be Candy's guide to greatness. Or you did you say, please, please, can I ride Candy? No, no. They they asked if I'd like to um, last year, and um, because I was taking lessons from another friend of theirs. And they had two ponies in training at Julie's farm in Aptos, Whisper Equestrians, it's called. And um, so I would go once a month and drive and learn how to do this because I had to learn this stuff. And then my friend Mimi said, well, would you like to drive Danny in the Santa Cruz County Fair last September? And I said, I don't know, Danny's a little stubborn and I'm afraid she'll do something in the ring that I won't know what to do. So she, she said, okay, well, we've entered Candy, and Candy's never won a, a ribbon. So how about if you warm her up? You'll drive Danny, you know, to warm her up as I'm work, showing one of the other ponies. And then we'll let you drive Candy in one show for ponies that have never won a ribbon. And then I'll drive her in other shows. And so there's no pressure. It's just get her used to the ring and stuff. So I was like, yeah, that'd be fun. And I love Candy. She's a very happy, gentle pony. Um, and, but she's a big bone girl. And, uh, in pony land, the judges like them a little more refined than, than candy and me. Um, but it's like, well, this will be fun, you know? So, uh, it was one of those remarkable days that one has very few times in their life. And it was last September. Uh, we went and, uh, I did that class and there were two judges and, st- both judges awarded Candy and I the blue ribbon. Ooh. So we were like, yay! Um, but so I drove out of the ring 
because Mimi was going to, you know, to do the next two classes with Candy. And she said, no way. I'm not ruining this. You go back in the ring. Mm-hmm. So uh, Candy and I won six blue ribbons. You know, we aced all three, three of the classes. And what the sweet thing was that, that Mimi was just great. So then she said, okay. Candy's going to be your show, your show pony for the next year. You got to get serious about this and train, and you know we're going to show her. So I had a number of affairs. My husband Larry was happened to be in Europe at the time of that show, and so he was like nervous that he didn't think I really should do this because in one show Candy bolted and Mimi had a hard time controlling her. So she he said you're not experienced enough to drive this pony, and you're going to fall out and kill yourself or something. So. Um, I uh, picked him up at the airport, <laughs> and his wearing first, only six ribbons. <laughs> his first thing was, "So what happened? What happened?" I said, "Oh, it's okay. I don't want to talk about it." He said, "Did you fall out?" I said, "No, no." He said, "Did you embarrass Mimi?" I said, "No, no, no." We, I said, "We did okay." You know, and I laid out the ribbons on his desk. <laughs> so I waited till he got home because it was, you know, the drama queen that I am. I wanted a big to do about it, and so he appropriately squealed with delight to see my six ribbons. So, um, yeah, and we've been having a blast putting up little YouTube videos. Uh, and, you know, it's been interesting, Andy. Up till now, I've done personal narrative videos that have been shown in museums and festivals, and I've been blessed with that. Um, but they're short films, and so there's no economy in them. I mean, you know, occasionally I'll scrape together some grant money, but mostly I'm just making them on my own. And... They get screened around the world, I'm happy, but, you know, you often have to sub- pay to submit your film at a festival, then because it's short, they show they don't pay you anything. So it's it's such a false economy. I know, I know. You know? And then I put things on YouTube, and this one, one of my pony pieces, over 3,000 people have seen mm. it. So I've been thinking a lot about the discounting of artists mm. in, in the film world and how really complicated it is. The Janicene thing in the end cost about $125,000 to make. PBS has a deal that if they show something, they don't have to pay music rights with BMI or ASCAP. So Janicene doesn't get anything for any of this, um, for her hour of talent. Nita picks it up from Channel 9 at KETC. KETC doesn't get anything. Nita picks it up, and then they offer it free to all these stations, so the 220 stations. So through it all, artists are making this work to be distributed for free. Tell me about it. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, why, <laughs> why do we do it? I don't know. And why, after just doing this, I'm already doing my 541 Broadway. You know, it's like, it's, it's, the economy of it is just kind of crazy. What's nice is I think it's also impacted my work here at the foundation because I realized that the majority of funding for film in this country is geared towards post-production funds. Mm. And I thought, unless you have the money to start these things, and after a while, if you don't, you have a track record, isn't anyone going to invest in artists? So we just, it, it's small beginnings, but uh, our board put aside $100,000 uh, for early production support for documentaries mm. made by filmmakers living in the Bay Area about Bay Area themes. And our first round is coming up, and we had 57 applications, which is just great. And we are going to support four or five filmmakers at twenty or $25,000 early on in the making of their work so that they can get enough footage so that other funders, the few that there are out there, can actually take a look at the work and say, okay, we want to invest. Because I realize we need to invest in artists uh, from the beginning. I agree. Now let me ask you an unfair question. Does the foundation have any plans to fund podcasting? Um, it hasn't come up yet, so I don't know. Okay. And I will certainly look at that. <laughs> um, the whole issue of online mm-hmm. and the whole kind of the, the decentralization of dissemination of information right now is a fascinating thing for philanthropy to, to grapple with. Mm-hmm. So, And if someone published if it's online... And what does it mean when, you know, somebody gets so many hits? And and so uh, I would say philanthropy is still in the last century mm-hmm. and has not uh, been able to figure things out. But uh, with friends like you and artists like you always pushing from the edge, 
I think that's what, where change happens. And so I hope that uh, in the near future, we can be talking about that. That's a very gracious answer. I appreciate it very much. Um, I know you have other appointments. I really appreciate the time. You're a fascinating man, and uh, I wish you luck in everything you're doing. Thank you, Andy. Now I ask you, on what podcast can you hear about Janice Ian, some of the greats of modern dance? And to top it all off, John Kalaki gave me a gift that I will put a, take a picture of and put on my website. I like honey, and I like those little squeezy honey bears. And I noticed in John's office, he had a statue that looked just like a honey bear, but it wasn't made out of plastic. It was very nice acrylic. And because I liked it so much, he gave it to me right then and there. So it's missing its little hat, its little spout, and I need to get that for it. But then when I do, I'll put, put a picture online and you can see a new treasure in Andy's treasure trove, courtesy of John Kalaki. Now I'd like to wind up the episode by playing you a song by Janice Ian. On her website, JaniceIan.com, she has a page full of free music downloads where you can get her music for free. And this cut is especially appropriate now uh, on the eve of the election and specifically having to do with Proposition 8 here in California, hoping to make same-sex weddings illegal. Well, here at Andy's Treasure Trove, We'd like to urge you to vote no on Proposition 8. And here's Janice Ian's way of talking about that subject. I'll see you next week. And thanks, as always, for listening. We're married in London, but not in New York. <laughs> Spain says we're kosher. The States say we're pork. <laughs> we went in Toronto. The judge said Amen. And when we got home, we were single again. It's hard being married and living in sin. Sometimes I'm not sure just which state I am in. Thank God I'm not Catholic. I'd be a mess. Trying to figure out what to confess. Passport in Sweden says I've got a wife Amsterdam tells me I'm partnered for life But back in America, land of the free I'm a threat to the national security <laughs> If I were a frog, here is what I would say it's hard being green, it's hard being gay But love has no color, and hearts have no sex So love where you can, and screw all the rest Thank you very much. All rights reserved, Andy Moore, Treasure Trove Productions.